Our next speaker, uh, Benny, is a proud social justice cleric, skeptic, atheist, and trans man. He lives in Chicago with his spouse, Bunny, and slightly radioactive cat who yells a lot. Currently a student completing a degree in science stuff, Benny spends his spare time with his poly family in Madison, Wisconsin. He writes the blog Scrappy Deviations at the Orbit about atheism, science, trans issues, neurodiversity, polyamory, kink, and anything shiny that catches his eye. Please welcome Benny Vimes to the stage. Thank you, Lauren. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to be talking today about the medical issues related to transition for transgender people. Um, as you can see, the title of this is Maybe He's Born With It, Maybe It's Testosterone Cipionate. Answer is, it's testosterone cipionate, folks. I was not born like this. Um, <laughs> mostly, uh, mostly that. Some of it is just pure charm. Um, this talk does have just a couple of content notes for you. Uh, I'm going to be discussing anatomy. It's impossible to have this conversation without talking about genitals, breasts, and secondary sex characteristics. We're going to talk about medical treatments here because that is the topic, um, and that does include things like surgery and injectable medications. Um, also, I will be discussing impacts of these treatments on sexual function, uh, but I'm not going to be explicit. There's a few medical drawings in here, but nothing's going to be sexually themed. There are no gross surgical photos, um, and I'm not going to be showing any images that include nudity. Uh, so that is the information I think you guys need to have. Um, so why did I want to do this talk? Uh, so. I wanted to combat some misinformation that I've heard within circles that are mostly good on sort of the social parts of trans issues, but not great about understanding some of the more nuanced detail. Um, I wanted to do this talk because people are curious. They ask me questions about transition all the time, uh, and this was an opportunity to answer some of those so that other trans people who don't want to be asked those questions don't have to be asked them as much. Um, and I want to demystify it a little bit. There is, uh, I think, sometimes a sort of magical aura around transition where especially our media talks about transition as if um, you kind of are one thing and you go into a magic box and come out something else. Um, and, uh, and that's not true at all. Uh, and so hopefully this will help sort of demystify that and bring um, the idea of transition more into the real world. The, all that said, I'm not a doctor, um, I am a nerd, uh, and so this is not medical advice. Um, I hope that this information is going to be helpful to people, uh, but if someone in here is thinking about transitioning or already transitioning, please do not take this as medical advice. Talk to your actual medical care providers. All right, so we're talking about medical treatment here, but that doesn't mean that transgender people are sick. Um, transition... Is, uh, is treated medically because we're changing the body. Um, but there are other things that are not diseases that we also treat in a medical environment in our current culture. Uh, the most common one would be pregnancy. Pregnancy is not a disease, it's a natural part of life, um, but we often treat it medically um, and utilize medical uh, services in order to get more ideal results for people. Um, so that's, that's I, I think, a common misconception is that being transgender is, uh, is an illness, and most of us just don't think of it that way. Also, transition doesn't create or define our gender. We have a gender identity already, and then we, many people choose to undergo different aspects of transition in order to change our bodies. But bodies and gender are two different things, um, and so the transition doesn't take somebody who is, for example, a woman and make them a man. I was a guy-ish already, and I made a transition that made me appear to be what our society considers to be a man. All right, so um, now we're gonna go to class. There's a lot of information here. I'm gonna go through it a little bit on the quick side. Um, I hope that if you guys have any further questions about this information that you will come to me later and ask. We're not gonna be doing a Q&A for this because there's a lot to cover. Um, and also, the questions often really get into the weeds. Um, and so if you wanna get into the weeds about this stuff, I encourage you to contact me online, talk to me while I'm here the rest of the weekend. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions face to face. All right, so um, there are standards of care that exist for treating transgender people in the medical and psychological world. Uh, these started in the United States in 1979, there was a, a standards of care written called the Harry Benjamin Standards of Care, named for the doctor who uh, started this. Um, back then, they required a real-life test, which was at least a year living in, um, in a binary gender identity. So if you were transitioning to be 
uh, as a trans woman. You had to live in the world as a woman before gaining access to medical coverage. Um, and uh, it also was really designed to um, prevent transition to make sure that only the right kind of trans people had access to these kinds of medical care. It reinforced a lot of stereotypes about gender. The old standards of care really said you could only transition if the doctors thought that you would pass afterward, that you would be perceived as a cisgender person after transition. Um, they also reinforced ideas about uh, the causes of, of um, being transgender, so people who had histories of sexual assault couldn't tra transition, people who had other forms of mental illness um, couldn't transition, uh, and that, so these standards of care were um, pretty widely disliked by transgender people. In 2006, the standards became renamed the WPATH standards, there were a few v versions in between, and we are now currently at WPATH version 7. Um, there's still some gatekeeper model to this, still some idea that therapists and doctors should be making decisions for the patient, but it's getting much better. Uh, and the WPATH standards do now allow for informed consent models. So the idea that a transitioning person should be the one who's making decisions about the, their medical care and whether or not to transition and how, rather than medical providers being the ones doing that. So it's a significant improvement. There are still areas for improvement, but um, I'm impressed with the, the, the progress that's already been made. I transitioned 15 years ago. I began my transition under the Harry Benjamin standards, um, and that sucked. So I'm glad that more people don't have to go through that. The informed consent model allows trans people to make decisions for ourselves, it's supported by most of us, and it is supported by more progressive medical providers, um, including like a lot of feminist clinics uh, and Planned Parenthood, who is now offering um, hormones, uh, which is a, a new um, development that I'm very happy about. Transition's not an event, it doesn't just happen overnight. I'm gonna talk about a lot of different aspects of it, but they can take place over long periods of time. That process may include lots of things other than the stuff that I'm covering here today that's pretty medical. Uh, so it can include those things, plus also buying a whole new wardrobe. Um, it can include dealing with facial hair, dealing with um, haircuts, getting wigs. Um, it can include coming out, a whole bunch of legal stuff, like changing our IDs and names, um, chest binding, prosthetics, makeup, lots and lots and lots of different, different aspects. How we make these decisions uh, about which aspects of transition to do um, is a bunch of different ways. A lot of it is desired perception. What do I want my body to look like and how do I want the world to perceive me? Um, it also can be relieving dysphoria. Dysphoria is the experience that your body is not right. Um, that uh, the way that I experienced dysphoria was particularly around my chest, um, that for me, having breasts was really upsetting. It was a deeply uncomfortable experience, both physically and emotionally, um, and so I made the choice to have that, have a breast reduction surgery uh, in order to relieve that experience of daily dysphoria, that my body didn't match what I wanted it to or what I felt like it should in my mind. Another thing that we have to take into account is cost. Um, Many insurance companies do not cover anything related to transition-related care. This has gotten somewhat better in recent years, and I would anticipate it getting substantially worse in the next few years in the United States. Uh, in some other countries, transition-related care is entirely covered by national health care systems, um, but in the United States, it's really a mishmash. People have a lot of different experiences, and people who don't have any insurance obviously are paying for all of it themselves. Um, there's also legal ID issues to take into consideration. Which state you live in in the United States or which country you live in in the world is going to designate which medical care is required to get your IDs changed. In some states in the United States, you have to have had surgery on your genitals in order to change your ID or your, your birth certificate. Um, in the United States right now, again, this might change, uh, is um, you do not need to have had medical care in order to get your passport changed. You do need to be under the care of a healthcare provider. Um, they write you a letter, but you actually don't need to be on hormones. You don't need to have any surgery. There's also medical indications. There's going to be some things that are less safe for people to do given certain medical experiences, um, and so uh, that's some, definitely something to consult your physician on. All right, so we're gonna start with hormones. Testosterone is a pretty simple chemical. Um, it's used by transgender men and some transmasculine people. Um, most people who choose to take it will take it forever, but some are gonna take it temporarily and get the effects that they wanna have and then stop. Um, most of the effects that come from testosterone are gonna be permanent. Once you have them, they're very difficult to reverse. And the full effect does take several years, so particularly beard growth takes a while. 
Effects of testosterone are all the things you would expect them to be, all the things that happen to teenage cisgender boys as they um, go into puberty, so lower voice and facial hair, um, lots of body hair, changed fat deposits from like the hips to the belly usually. Um, balding happens, it's not that bad. Um, <laughs> Um, people who take testosterone usually have ceased menstruation, as long as the dose is in the general range that is recommended. A significantly increased libido is pretty common. Um, and things that people may not expect, the clitoris grows significantly. Uh, that's often the very first thing that people experience when they start taking testosterone. And this is because that tissue is exactly the same tissue that forms the, the penis as a uh, person who has a penis is developing. Um, so that same kind of growth is gonna happen in that area. There's some side effects of taking testosterone. Acne is almost universal. Um, mood changes are common. They can sometimes be negative. They can also be positive, largely for people who are experiencing decreased dysphoria. There is some risk of blood clots. It's pretty rare. Liver toxicity, also very rare. And the cardiovascular risks are there, but they tend to increase our risk to very similar to that of cisgender men. Um, so that's an increase over somebody who's not taking testosterone, um, but it doesn't make my risk factors different than that of my cisgender brother. Um, also, there's a significant decrease in fertility, but testosterone is not effective birth control. People who are using testosterone should use an additional form of birth control if they're at risk of becoming pregnant. Methods of delivery, most of us use injections. It's uh, definitely the easiest, the least expensive option, and it's a good high dose that's going to get your blood levels to where you want them to be. But there are also dermal patches. They're very expensive, and I hated them. Um, there's also uh, some topical creams and gels you can use. Those are going to be pretty low dose. Some people find they don't work for them at all. Um, and there is an implant now and also a long-term injection. These are expensive, but if you can get them covered by insurance, they're kind of great because you only have to do it a couple of times a year, and that dose is going to be really nice and steady. So I would really like to get the implant to the long-term uh, injections. That's a goal for me. Um, for people who are going the other direction, people who were born um, with a penis and testicles uh, may want to transition to, um, uh, to being perceived more feminine. Um, and so the, they will need to take multiple hormone options. Um, one of them is antiandrogens. That's going to be medications that are going to decrease your testosterone levels or the effects of testosterone. Steroidal antiandrogens are the most common. So here in the United States, spironolactone is by far the most common medication. There are some other options overseas. Um, there are some non-steroidal antiandrogens I'll talk about. Usually these drugs can be discontinued after orchiectomy, which is the removal of the testicles. We'll talk about that, but that's the primary place in the body that testosterone is created, so you take that away, you don't have to take this, these drugs anymore. Spironolactone is going to decrease blood testosterone levels to a level that is lower than cisgender women. It is a really common misconception that trans women have a lot of testosterone in their body, and people who are taking this medication have very low testosterone levels, lower than cisgender women. I think that's interesting information. And it's going to result in a decrease of a lot of those things that testosterone causes. So uh, it's going to decrease body hair some, not all the way. It's going to decrease libido. It's going to change muscle mass. It dramatically decreases fertility for most people. It stops your hair falling out, which is cool. Um, and generally stops spontaneous erections, but doesn't tend to stop being able to have erections uh, intentionally. It does lead to some breast development. Um, it's a diuretic. So when we talk about the need for trans people to have access to bathrooms, this is one of the reasons why that's not a trivial issue at all, um, because people who are taking this medication gotta pee all the time, you guys. Um, so we need good access to bathrooms for a bunch of reasons, but this one is a very direct biological one. It also leads to some breast tenderness. Um, there are some rare but existing uh, dangerous side effects. High blood potassium is something to keep track of because it, that's really a thing to be concerned about. And it can, in some cases, cause depression. Other options are non-steroidal antiandrogens. Um, finasteride is by far the most common. Uh, it can be used with spironolactone, um, or it can be used for those who don't tolerate it well. So people who have a bad depression reaction to spironolactone may use this drug alone. It's not going to decrease blood testosterone, but it does block the uptake of testosterone in the body. So the blood levels will still be high, but the body doesn't respond to testosterone in the same way. It's going to have less extreme but similar effects. It might be a little better at decreasing hair loss, um, and it is taken orally. Estrogen is the hormone that most people think about. Um, it's the primary hormone for feminizing effects, so all of the things that you think of cisgender girls going through in puberty, estrogen does most of those things. It's usually taken for all of life. 
It um, can be lowered in dosage, but not eliminated after archaeotomy. There are several different forms. Estradiol is by far the most common. Uh, it's got lower toxicity than older versions, especially version, versions that come from horses. So equine estrogen is a thing that people used to use but don't really anymore. Um, it's really easy to test for in blood levels. That's a, the reason for using estradiol. Uh, some of those effects are permanent, but not most of them. Um, so you may notice here that testosterone is a really powerful drug. It makes all these permanent changes to the body. Estrogen's not so much, and so you continue have to t having to take it forever. Um, and uh, and it, it's not going to overtake a lot of the changes that testosterone already made, like lower voice and beard hair. So it's not going to make you not, not have a beard anymore. Got to do... Um, uh, hair removal processes for that. Um, it usually takes about two years for people to get full effect on estrogen. And it definitely has a significant increase in, in breast development, so it's gonna increase the size of the breast, the size of the nipple, some in areola changes, big fat redistribution changes. Um, that is actually kind of a, a major thing for a lot of people. How we fit in our clothes is really important. Um, it's gonna result in a decrease in muscle mass, sex drive, testicular size and sperm development. Uh, those are a lot of the same things that the antiandrogens did, so the two of them together is gonna have a strongest effect. Common side effects are weight changes, breast tenderness, mood changes, that sort of thing. Most people tolerate those pretty well. Um, the uncommon side effects like depression, liver toxicity, and blood clots are really something to pay attention to and the reason why it's good to have a doctor keeping close track of those sorts of things. Um, estradiol is often taken orally. It can also be taken intramuscularly as an injection. Uh, however, right now, there is a significant shortage of estradiol uh, for injection. There's very few cisgender women taking this after menopause anymore for some, I, as I understand it, fairly good um, biological medical reasons. But that means that this drug is mostly intended for trans women now, and so nobody's making it anymore. Um, this is a problem that really needs to be solved. This is something that people who are interested in social justice for trans people can make noise about, is the availability of this drug. Uh, because it makes a big difference for people to be able to have steady levels. The oral medication um, is, uh, is just just not as ideal for a lot of people's needs. There are also patches, gels, and creams. I don't know anyone who uses them because uh, they're sort of expensive and they're really hard to dose right. Um, and there are no implants currently available. There have been in the past. Uh, I'm not quite sure why they don't exist anymore, but I think it's for the same reason as the intramuscular injections. Um, but it was really nice when they were available because you only needed it about twice a year. Progesterone is a great skepticism question. Um, there's a strong belief within transgender women's communities that it helps with breast development. Um, many, many, many trans women are saying my breast development on the drugs that currently exist is not sufficient. I'm not happy with it. It is not dealing with my dysphoria appropriately. And providers need to take that concern really seriously. They need to hear that as a real thing and not just blow it off. Um, but research doesn't support right now the idea that progesterone is helpful for breast development. There isn't a lot of research, but that which we have doesn't show any difference. Um, so if there is an effect, it's probably pretty small. The risks of this medication are really real. There's a risk of increased blood clots, heart problems, cancer, and stroke. Um, and therefore, that makes this a really important question to figure out whether or not it's helpful and weigh those risks in a way that's intelligent. If we just refuse to provide progesterone entirely, there are many patients who are gonna self-medicate with it. And so that's why I think that it's really important for providers to take this need seriously and talk a lot with their, their patients about it and consider having patients on it even if it doesn't help, if it's going to make sure that they're getting tracked appropriately and keep an eye on these potential risk factors. Uh, so I would like to see significantly more research in this area. I wanna see this question answered. Does it help or does it not help? And I'd let, I think that that's gonna help a lot of people make better informed decisions and also figuring out other ways that we can um, help with the breast development question because it's so important to so many people. Last hormone to discuss are gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonists. Uh, these are colloquially known as puberty blockers and they are so awesome. Um, so these are drugs that are really pretty safe. They prevent the onset or continuation of puberty so they are used in young adolescents. Um, all of the effects are reversible. You just go off the drug and puberty happens. Um, so this gives 
young people time to decide about transition. I get chills thinking about this, these medications because if this had been available to me as a teenager, it would have dramatically changed my life. Uh, I knew that I was trans pretty young, um, and in today's climate, these sorts of medications would have been available to me, uh, and the idea that a teenager can figure out that they're trans is much more known now than it was in the mid-90s. Um, so I'm really excited about these medications. They can be administered as a nasal spray, um, which is the easiest to stop uh, like right away, right? So you decide you do this for a little while and then you don't want to anymore or there's problems with the medication, which are rare but they can happen. Um, the nasal spray is gonna be the easiest for that. But there's also injections um, and an implant available that you just do and don't have to worry about for quite a while. So um, I'm excited about these drugs. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna talk about surgery for a while. Surgery always carries risks with it. Um, for many of us, these risks are completely worth it. Uh, but anesthesia always has risks. There's risks of infection and pain, loss of sensation, scar complications. Um, there are some things that we can do to decrease risk if we're thinking about having surgery. Quitting smoking is a big thing. Making sure that our overall health is as good as it can be. There are some medications that doctors will ask us to stop taking before surgery. Um, so mastectomy and breast reduction uh, is colloquially known as top surgery or chest surgery. Um, surgeries can be done without hormones. Uh, that's actually fairly common. Um, and these surgeries are pretty common even outside of trans men. Uh, so cisgender women, men with excess breast tissue, they have breast reductions or chest reconstructions all the time. This is great because it means that lots of plastic surgeons know how to do these kinds of surgeries. The surgeon that I went to had never met a trans person before in his life, as far as he knew, but he'd done a whole bunch of these surgeries, had very, very good effects, and I'm extremely happy with my results. Uh, so many people will go to doctors who are open-minded but haven't dealt with, with trans people to have this surgery and also breast augmentations because they're pretty common surgeries. And it's almost always outpatient. Um, I went home the same day, uh, and I have been with other trans men who've had these surgeries and have gone home the same day. It's really painful, but it's nice to be able to sleep in your own bed. Uh, there's two major types of surgery. Uh, the keyhole or minimal scar surgery um, is done for people with smaller breasts, and it's basically like liposuction. There's a very small incision. You may not even be able to see it on this image. That's kind of the point. Um, so it results in really, really small scars. There's no removal of skin. The nipple isn't moved, usually isn't even changed, but sometimes they make it a little smaller. Um, and recovery is four to six weeks, but actually a lot of people go back to work after a week or two. Uh, you just can't pick up anything heavy for a while because your pectoral muscles really don't want you to do that. Um, for larger breasts, uh, there's a lot more incision. So buttonhole surgeries, uh, double incision and inverted T are kind of the three different types. They're all really similar. You do a, a big long cut all the way under the, the underside of the breast. Uh, and remove a certain amount of skin and all of the, a lot of the breast tissue. And then the nipple gets moved. Um, the buttonhole, double incision, and inverted T names are different names for the ways in which would they deal with the removal of skin and the moving of a nipple. Um, the, there's often a change in nipple size, so many people want the size of their nipple decreased in this surgery, um, so that can be done pretty easily. Uh, there is a risk um, with the double incision and inverted T, uh, especially the double, double incision surgery, um, of the loss of the nipple entirely after surgery, and so buttonhole is getting to be more and more common and has better results. It's about eight weeks recovery. Um, that's, that's about the experience that I had. And there's a lot more scar tissue from this surgery uh, because they're removing skin, so there's a lot of... Um, a lot of stitches going on. Um, but usually that's hid right sort of un in the underside of the pectoral muscle. Uh, so they, they tend to be pretty subtle on a lot of people. Breast augmentation. This is kind of exactly the same surgery that a cisgender woman who wants to have larger breasts would have. Um, and therefore, requirements from surgeons will vary dramatically. Uh, some of them want um, patients who have gone through pretty extensive, extensive therapy and, um, and have been on hormones for a long time. Some don't really care. Um, if it's done when not using hormones though, uh, or it's, rather it can be done when not using hormones, although there can be skin elasticity issues, um, and if hormones don't lead, lead to satisfactory breast size. Usually hormones alone will get people to somewhere between an A and a B cup, um, and that's just not sufficient for a lot of people's uh, ideas of what they want their body to look like. It's a very common surgery in the United States. Um, in fact, I've read in some places that breast augmentations are the most common plastic surgery in the US. Uh, I'm not totally sure that that's true because those sources were not entirely reliable. Because um, when doctors are trying to sell you this surgery, they're gonna tell you that. Um, but, uh, but at the very least, it's very common. So there's a lot of different options uh, and a lot of surgeons able to do it. 
Sometimes it takes more than one surgery, but not super often. Uh, and recovery can be really short. I was very surprised that a lot of these things were saying you could do vigorous exercise and lifting after two weeks. Um, there are a lot of options, saline and silicone, textured and smooth on the outside of the implant, above or below the muscle, which is what this image is, um, the different sizes available, uh, and there are a whole bunch of different incision types, far more than I could have made a slide on. We would have been here all day. Um, but all of the, these different choices are going to impact the way that they look and the way that they feel. Uh, and so there's a lot of conversation to be had with a surgeon about what those options are, what impact that's going to have, how long different types of implants last, because there is a difference between silicone and saline. Um, and all those kinds of questions are great to, to have discussed with a physician. So now we're going to get to genital surgeries. Um, the oophorectomy and hysterectomy are the removal of ovaries and uterus. Um, they can decrease, but not eliminate the need for testosterone. Uh, they also do seem to decrease the risk of cancer and some other diseases of those systems, so they're recommended for people who are gonna take testosterone for a very long time. Um, they're usually performed vaginally. This is true also for people who are having them for other reasons, because hysterectomy is a pretty common surgery. Um, and vaginal removal uh, means there's very little scar tissue or none at all. Uh, can sometimes be done laparoscopically, which is when they use um, like tubes and cameras and, and don't have to have very big incisions. Um, it's usually outpatient, sometimes a short hospital stay, and recovery time can be four to six weeks for heavy exercise, uh, but one week to get back to work. Uh, orchiectomy is the removal of the testes. It um, decreases or eliminates the need for antiandrogens, so that's really desirable for a lot of people who are looking for those surgeries to not have to take spirolactone anymore. Um, and also decreases the need for uh, estrogen to some degree, but like testosterone, you do still want to be taking it long term. Um, and in fact, in both of these surgeries, uh, this one and the one before it, continuing to either take estrogen or testosterone is really important for bone health. Um, so once the, once the source of natural hormones has been removed from the body, you want to make sure that something is going to be there to support bone health and prevent osteoporosis. Um, it's going to impact sex drive and orgasm for some people, but not everybody. Lots of people um, continuing to use the hormones they were using are going to have exactly the same sort of uh, results in that. It's usually an outpatient um, surgery. I don't know of anybody who stayed inpatient, but I suppose it could happen. And recovery time is really fast for this one. The incision's really small, um, and, uh, and a lot of the things that I've read and the people I've talked to said they were back to work and pretty much living normally after about a, a week. Now we get into some much more intensive surgeries than this, and these are rarer. Phalloplasty is the creation of a penis. Um, it is mostly done in trans men. This is a surgery that is uh, not super common outside of that, but it is a little bit more common now in um, cisgender men who either have uh, a congenital condition that makes their penis not present or um, not shaped in the way they uh, would like. Um, it also is a little bit more common now in people with injuries. Um, one of the things that has been an outcome of much of the way that uh, the wars in the Middle East over the past few decades have happened is that a lot of people have lower body injuries, uh, and many of those include injuries to the groin. Phalloplasty surgeries have significantly improved because of this. It has been um, a silver lining to a terrible problem. Uh, so the penis is made from skin found elsewhere on the body. Um, the forearm is the most common, so they take skin from the inside of your forearm and create a tube out of it to create a penis, um, and then skin graft onto that as well. So there is really, really big scarring from the location of the skin graft. That's something to be aware of with this surgery. They can also take skin from other parts of the body. The thigh was pretty common. Um, the torso is pretty common, uh, so they'll take skin from right above uh, the genital area um, and be able to not fully separate that from the body. Um, there's a bunch of different incision sites for that. The results for that don't seem to be as good as the forearm option. And they'll also sometimes take nerves, blood, well, they do take nerves and blood vessels and sometimes muscle uh, for, for um, creating the penis. Uh, there's multiple aspects of this. So they're going to create the penis, that's the phalloplasty. They'll create a scrotum, the scrotoplasty, that tissue for that usually comes from the labia. There's usually, but not always, an erectile implant put in. These are the same types of implants that people with erectile dysfunction sometimes get. Um, the vaginectomy is a removal and closure of the vagina. Um, and there will be a urethroplasty, which is running something to function as a urethra through the penis. I will say the vaginectomy is not always done with the phalloplasty, but it is very, very common. 
Um, but if one chooses to have a phalloplasty without a vaginectomy, I just want to, don't know if Bria's still in the room, but you might have a penis vagina. Um, she was asking if that was possible. It, it is. <laughs> um, a phalloplasty penis often has no erotic sensation. It's going to have, at best, uh, the same nerve sensation that the skin of the donor site has. Um, so, and sometimes not even that, uh, there is a possibility of neuropathy, very little nerve sensation in that area, but usually normal skin sensation develops. Urinary complications are extremely common with this surgery. Uh, about 50% of people end up with urinary fistulas, which is a hole in the urethra that goes through the outside of the penis. It's um, uh, fixable with further surgery, but it's a really, really common problem. And there's a very long recovery. Many people spend weeks in bed after this surgery. All of that said is the reason why phalloplasty is rare among transgender men. Lots of people who would like to have this surgery are not going to because those results are not ideal. Um, but many people do it, and the more who do, the better these surgeries may become over time. Another option uh, as an alternative to that, and this is also a slightly less expensive option, is um, medioidoplasty, which I hope I'm pronouncing right, uh, uses the existing clitoris as a micropenis. Um, there's a lot of tissue that is holding the clitoris into the body. If that tissue is cut, it comes forward. You can get a micropenis of about two inches at most for most people with this surgery. Uh, and the urethra can be placed through it. So it can function very much like anybody else's penis. Uh, it's just small. Um, the scrotum is created out of labial folds, same as with the uh, phalloplasty. Silicone implants are used to create testicles. Usually, the vaginectomy happens with this one as well, but again, not absolutely necessary. Um, it's less expensive and faster recovery than the phalloplasty surgery. And after surgery, penetration ability is uncommon because it, the micropenis is small enough that it generally isn't functional in that way. But almost all people who have it can have erections and normal orgasm, which is a significant different improvement over the phalloplasty. This is an outpatient surgery, um, and usually people are catheterized for two to three weeks and then have a few, weeks long, few more weeks recovery time after that. The vaginoplasty is the surgery that most people have referred to as the surgery. Um, I think that's really unfortunate, and the reason why I've put it uh, last in the surgical options here is because I really want to draw attention to the fact that there are a lot of different things that people do, and transition is not defined by this particular surgery. But um, it gen generally has significantly better uh, endpoints than the surgery is intended for transgender men. Uh, so trans women and other people who get vaginoplasty surgeries tend to have very good outcomes. The vagina is created usually from the skin of the penis and scrotum and then inverted into the body. Um, they call it a penile inversion. The remaining scrotal tissue can be used to make labial folds. The glands of the penis is used to create an external clitoris and the urethra is shortened and moved. The results after vaginoplasty tend to be very good. There are really high satisfaction rates. Most people achieve good sexual function and orgasm. Usually there's about a three-day hospital stay, um, and then about 12 weeks before resuming sexual activity, and also things like riding horses and bicycles, as I read. Um, there is some aftercare that's required for a really long period of time and then for life with after vaginoplasty, that's dilation. So these uh, tools that you're seeing here um, are vaginal dilators. They are used by many people who were born with a vagina um, and are also used by, by uh, people who've had vaginectomies in order to maintain um, the proper function and, and uh, size. It's sort of stretching of the vagina. Um, it's done really frequently early on and then can be decreased to a couple of times a week uh, for most people over the course of the lifetime. So what do we want going forward? Uh, we'd really like transplants, especially people who are not satisfied with the current results of phalloplasty surgeries. Penile transplants would be awesome. Um, we would like lab-grown organs so that we don't have to depend on people to die to get these organs. Um, those are things that I think would benefit huge ranges of the population, uh, and that definitely includes trans folks. We'd like better hormone implants. Uh, we'd like the hormone implants that are for estrogen to come back on the market and definitely an improvement in access to the injectable estrogens. Um, and, and more access to hormone implants for testosterone would also be great. We want coverage for these treatments through health insurance. Um, we want coverage for all of our medical care, not just some of it, and for all of us, not just some of us. And we want legal recognition without transition. Um, 
All of these options are really great for the people who want them, but they should not be necessary in order to have our IDs changed and our identities recognized by society. There's some more excited. So thank you very much. If you guys have any questions, please come and ask me. Um, I've got more information, and I'm totally happy to share these resources and my slides. And thank you very much.